Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful people. Today, we are going to continue to speak and discuss American imperialism. We will look at the Spanish-American War, the Philippine-American War, and finally look at Roosevelt and Latin America. We last left off with the sinking of the USS Maine in Havana Harbor. This will lead to war with the empire of Spain. Uh, in the name of freeing Cuba, the United States will go to war. The Spanish-American War of 1898, it is with this war that the United States gets its empire. This war was quick. This war was hard fought. And this war will leave the United States in a very different position upon victory. The Yanko Spanko War. Military preparedness. The United States was, quite frankly, not prepared for war. The U.S. Army in 1898 was just 28,000 soldiers. That's 1 20th, 1 20th the size of France or Germany. Its Navy uh, was 10,000 men. That's 1 6th the size of Britain's and half the size of Spain's. However, however, the U.S. Navy at this time was quite modern and the Spanish Navy was quite the opposite. This proves to be a very popular war. By no means did all Americans support this war, but it is incredibly popular. The army asks for 50,000 volunteers and receives 220,000 volunteers. Again, America wants its empire. These young men raised on stories from their fathers from the great civil war put on the american uniforms what about the spanish armada every child at this time was raised with stories of the great spanish armada they ruled the seas in the 1500s this is not the empire it once was this graph shows you how spain rises rises in power owns half of the new world incredibly rich however after the 1600s and the napoleonic occupation it is a shadow of its former self yes they had an armada many of these ships were not seaworthy many of them were literally rotting in harbors scattered throughout the world so again the united states is not fighting the spanish armada of, uh, 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 of, of times past. Just please keep that in mind. On paper, on paper, many European experts said, well, the United States is going to lose, of course. But in reality, the United States had taken the advice of, of man um, and his influence of, of, sea, of sea power upon history and built up that Navy, which we spoke about in our last lesson. If any man if any man understood the importance of naval power who was within government was the assistant secretary of the Navy, Mr. Teddy Roosevelt. Roosevelt was brilliant. He was tough. He was also very much an imperialist. And he saw this as an opportunity. This isn't just about defeating Spain and liberating the Cuban people. Roosevelt had his eyes on the Philippines. The Philippines, uh, 7,500 islands in the South Pacific, Roosevelt saw as an opportunity, as an opportunity. And so he does something. He does something. He orders, he orders the Navy to, if war should break out, if war should break out, to attack the Philippines. At this time, this is a Spanish possession. He orders the Navy to attack the Philippines. Now, the U.S. squadron was stationed here in Hong Kong. The only reason Roosevelt had 
the authority to order this is that the Secretary of the Navy, John D. Long, was away on business. Or it might have been person some sort of business. I don't know if it was professional or I assume it was personal business. He's away from his position. And so uh, Roosevelt orders, if war should break out, attack the Philippines, attack the capital of Manila. It has to be cleared through McKinley. McKinley approves of it because he too sees the importance of the Philippines. Let's cut the Spanish off of their Pacific fleet and so that we could quickly uh, and decisively defeat the Spanish. McKinley and Roosevelt also understood the importance of the Philippines as a gateway to the Chinese markets. Uncle Sam will just be one quick step away from allowing commerce with the Chinese kingdom. Again, that is a giant, giant reason behind the United States attacking and attempting to occupy the Philippines. Now, the Philippines, like Cuba, had been ruled by the Spanish since the 15, 1600s. The Spanish had tried to convert the Filipinos. Many, many, many did. It's a majority Catholic country with, with large amounts of Muslims and other faiths within it. The Spanish, like in Cuba, introduced what many would consider an unfair system, meaning that if you were Spanish blood or ha being have even better being born in Spain, you were at the top of Filipino society. Uh, but what does follow, interestingly enough, like Mexico, like Cuba, is uh, a strict hierarchy of the uh, uh, various ethnicities, but also a blending. Many Filipinos learn Spanish, could read and write in Spanish, along with their native language. The Philippines was incredibly poor under Spanish rule. And like Cuba, would react quite harshly uh, when the Filipinos rose up and demanded more rights. Even before the United States arrives in the Philippines, the Spanish had been dealing with a so-called insurgency. Filipino rebels had been fighting Spanish troops in the countryside, trying to attain independence. Please keep that in mind. Long before the Americans arrived, Filipino guerrilla fighters had been fighting for independence on the islands. Again, 7,500 islands. And this is something new for American soldiers, dense, thick jungles, tropical warfare. This will be America's first taste of it, not its last, uh, but certainly its first taste of thick jungle combat. The Battle of Manila Bay. This was our first strike at the Spanish in the Philippines. Manila is the Philippine capital. Dewey, Captain Dewey, uh, was ordered to move in, move in from Hong Kong, our American Pacific fleet in the, the area. Uh, only six ships, but they're modern ships. They're modern ships. Hong Kong at this time was run by the British, and the American troops there had become quite friendly with the Americans. And when the British learn that the Americans are headed off to Manila Bay, they say prayers for the Americans because it's understood that Manila Bay is heavily, heavily protected. It is a suicide mission, they tell the Americans. But nonetheless, remember the main. Remember the main. And so the Americans slowly pull in to Manila Harbor. These will be the first shots of our war in the Philippines. Fighting breaks out. Fighting breaks out. But in reality, the ships of Spain in Manila Bay could hardly move. Many of them couldn't move. This is a decisive victory for the Americans. The 10-ship Spanish fleet was completely taken by surprise. Dewey's forces quickly defeated the Spanish fleet without a single American dying. 400 Spanish sailors were killed at the Battle of Manila Bay. 
in the hearts of many Americans, the USS Maine had been avenged. Dewey smashes Spain's fleet. In the aftermath, the Americans, upon hearing of this, were absolutely ecstatic. Absolutely ecstatic. However, Dewey has no troops. He has to sit in the bay for months and wait for troops, wait for reinforcements. We defeat the Spanish at Manila Bay, but we cannot enter into the Philippines. Dewey's glorious victory. Steaming past the batteries of the entrance to Manila, his war cry, remember the Maine. The brave Commodore destroyed, destroyed the Spanish fleet in the east and holds the city now at his mercy. Hardly, hardly. He has to wait for months for American troops to move on in. This is an image of British troops in Hong Kong hearing about how the Americans did it. You did it, lads. Those friends of theirs that had gone, that they said this is a death trap. No, the Americans did it. The Americans did it. War in the Philippines. War in the Philippines. Well, the first thing that the Americans do, the first thing that the Americans do is attach themselves to the insurgents. Emilio Aguinaldo, he was the leader of the rebels who were fighting against the Spanish long before the Americans ever arrived. The Filipino rebels or insurgents or patriots, you decide, saw the Americans as liberators. They were rest assured. Help us defeat the Spanish and you will finally attain your independence. And so the Americans fought alongside these insurgents against the Spanish in the Philippines. Manila Falls, Manila Falls, August 13th, 1898. Americans aided by the Filipino guerrilla fighters take Manila. Guam soon follows. One by one, the Spanish empire is falling apart at the hands of the Americans. It's during the fighting against the Spanish that the American government decides, you know what? The need is too great. We've waited long enough. We should annex Hawaii. The Republic of Hawaii is no more. And the United States formally annexes this territory, July 7th, 1898. Hawaiians were given full U.S. citizenship, and of course, Hawaii will become a state in 1959. Here is the lowering of the Hawaiian flag in a ceremony, and we will raise the American flag in its wake. The war in Cuba. The war in Cuba. After the declaration of war, the Spanish fleet heads for Cuba. However, however, it doesn't move quickly. It's a shadow of its former self. And the American Navy was able to blockade those ships. They couldn't reach the island. That being said, we were quite ill prepared. Tropical disease, the hot uh, uh, sun of the Cuban island, uh, the man in charge, General William R. Shafter, um, gets a case of gout. He's a very portly individual. And many times he's is carried around on a door throughout the island. His men literally have to carry him around. Um, it's not so much that we do so well in Cuba, quite frankly. It's only that the Spanish do so very, 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 very badly. But we're better equipped, much more enthusiastic, and we have greater numbers. Again, fighting in tropical heat is something new for the Americans. Dense, thick jungles in woolen, multi-layered uniforms. Now, one group of men that were much better suited for fighting in Cuba were the Rough Riders. The Rough Riders. This is a very colorful group of men in the U.S. Army. Uh, many of them were cowboys. Uh, but you have thrill seekers, ranchers, criminals, ruffians. Now, they're led, this motley cavalry, by Colonel Leonard Wood. But the, the man who really captures the imagination of the American people and becomes the face of the Rough Riders was none other than Theodore Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt, and this 
is commendable in my personal opinion, leaves his office as Lieutenant Secretary of the Navy and actually joins the Rough Riders. Imagine a politician who actually goes and fights in a war that he helped to cause. Could you imagine that? Can you? What? Wait, you what? And he does see action. He does see action. Uh, he'll kill at least one man while in Cuba. Now, the army has to lower its qualifications to allow Mr. Roosevelt in. He has terrible eyesight. He takes hundreds of pairs of eyeglasses with him in case he loses a pair. He has another one. Uh, he bought his uniform. He had his uniform especially designed by Brooks Brothers of New York, uh, a pearl shape, a, a pearl handled uh, pistol that he bought from Tiffany because you have to look good when you're fighting for your country. But Mr. Roosevelt captures the imagination of the American people actually going to fight for a war that you helped to cause as a politician is unheard of in the current uh, state of affairs in the Western world. Victory does, in fact, come. The United States will win a series of battles. The Spanish were ill-prepared, overwhelmed. With the war almost over, the United States moves in to occupy Puerto Rico. One by one, one by one, we're picking Spain's empire from her. August 12th, 1898, the, the Spanish will sign an armistice with the United States. The next day, Manila falls. So they sign an armistice with us. The next day, Manila falls. Keep that in mind because that's going to be a bone of contention with the Spanish. We already signed an armistice a day before Manila fell. The true killer, the true killer of American troops in this war was disease, tropical disease. While the Spanish killed about 400 Americans, 5,000 Americans will die from tropical disease. Spain will lose tens of thousands of men uh, from disease and U.S. bullets in the Philippines and in Cuba. But the true killer of Americans in this war were, were tropical disease. The spoils of war. The spoils of war. Well, Puerto Rico and Guam are going to be given to the Americans. Spain concedes. You get Puerto Rico and Guam, it's yours. It is yours. Cuba will be granted independence. The Americans agree to that. What about the Philippines? What about the Philippines? Americans offer the Spanish a deal, $20 million for the Philippines. The Spanish say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. The Philippines is not up for negotiation. You took Manila, the capital, the day after the uh, uh, armistice was signed. But again, Spain is not in a position to negotiate. The real question of what to do with the Philippines rests with Congress and the American public. Now, this is where we begin to get divided in this country. Are we going to turn the islands? over to uh, uh, Emilio and his rebels and allow it to be independent? Or are we going to annex as well the Philippines? What is he going to do with the Philippines? Asks the world. There's McKinley. The Philippine Islands. What will he do with it? What will he do with it? Do we allow it to be independent? Or are we going to annex those islands. This sparks national debate. The American public is quite torn. The American public and many members of Congress are quite torn. The Anti-Imperialist League was established. Their goal was to block annexation. Noted members of this organization, Mark Twain, Jane Adams, Andrew Carnegie, Samuel Gompers, Gompers, pardon me, even former President Grover Cleveland, Mark Twain said this on annexation of the Philippines and imperialism in general. He's a member of the Anti-Imperial League. He says this, once I was not anti-imperialist, I thought that the rescue of those islands from the government under which they had suffered for 300 years was a good business for us to be in. 
but I had not studied the Paris Treaty. When I found that it made us responsible for the protection of the friars and their property, I changed my mind. I didn't sign up for this. This treaty that you're negotiating with the Spanish in Paris, I didn't sign up for this. We shouldn't take over the Philippines. And Mark Twain was not alone. This cartoon is pointing out the fact that Uncle Sam wants to uh, improve the lives of Cuba. Puerto Rico, Hawaii, the Philippines in a very condescending way, right? He's taking up the white man's burden. He wants to bring us, bring them in into the civilized world. Well, Uncle Sam, Uncle Sam, the Native American isn't included. He's sitting in the back. The young black man over here, this young gentleman isn't included. He's washing the windows and the Chinese are excluded from our borders, period. Uncle Sam, why don't you take care of our classroom and all of its members before you start bringing in new students? That being said, the American people and Congress overall supported us taking over the Philippines. If we don't take over the Philippines, the Germans might. They have a battleship parked off the coast. They do. They're watching this. They're hungry for more land. The British might. Did Americans die so that the Germans could have a larger empire? The flag must stay put. The American Filipinos and the native Filipinos will have to submit, says this cartoon. In the end, the side of annexation wins. This cartoon shows, and this is the popular argument, that the Americans are gonna show the light to the Filipinos, whether they ask for it or not. We will bring them civilization freedom, education, justice, commerce. And this is the argument put forth by Josiah Strong, right? We have a duty. We have a duty. It also doesn't hurt that we could have naval bases there, trade with China, etc. December 10, 1898, the United States and Spain signed the Treaty of Paris the Philippine Islands now become U.S. territory, U.S. territory. The goal, the goal, or at least the stated goal, was to eventually make the Philippines independent once it was ready for self-government. This isn't going to be forever. You're not going to be another Alaska. You're not going to be another Hawaii. It's not forever. We simply need to help you help yourself so that you don't get taken over by another more fierce empire. This directly leads, this annexation directly leads to the Philippine-American War. The Filipinos had fought with the understanding that we are fighting for independence. And so when the Americans announced the annexation, many Filipinos feel quite betrayed, including Emilio Aguinaldo, on January 23rd, 1899, Filipino nationalists declare this man their president and declare the Philippines an independent republic. That would be the first independent republic in all of Asia. Um, but the Americans don't recognize this. The Americans declare this new republic a rogue government. You see, America wanted an empire and it got it, but now it has to keep it. Now it has to defend it. It's now entered the imperial game, just like Great Britain, just like France, just like Germany. And so more troops are sent to the island. More troops are sent to the island. About 126,000 American troops are sent to the Philippine Islands. We are gonna force the Filipinos to be free. Not the first or last time the United States has undertaken such a task. Now, we occupy the cities quite well. We occupy the cities quite well. However, the insurgents or freedom fighters, depending on your position, do not surrender. They continue to fight. At first, the fighting was quite favorable for the United States. Americans have 
more guns, better guns. Many Filipinos have no guns. The Americans are better supplied, better trained, etc. However, Filipino forces estimated between 100,000 and a million Filipino insurgents, depending on uh, 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 what week, what day. Remember, most of these men are civilians, and so you might go back to the crops, come back, fight the Americans, go back to the mountains, etc. At first, the Americans do quite well, incredibly well. However, however, Aguinaldo retreats into the mountains. He retreats with his troops into the jungles. This is where things begin to change for the Americans. This is when the tide begins to turn. By November of 1899, by November of 1899, Aguanado is leading a major guerrilla war against the Americans, and the Americans begin to lose hundreds against these rebels. The effects, well, the Philippine rebels or freedom fighters refuse to attack head on in decisive big battles. What they do is they harass the Americans. They attack supply lines. They uh, attack and hit and run tactics. Now, this is very common guerrilla warfare. When you are outnumbered, when you're facing larger numbers, better supplied, better trained, it would be quite foolish to fight face to face, would it not? Um, let me use the analogy. If I accidentally ran, uh, bumped into a, an MMA fighter in, in, in a bar, right? And he decides he wants to fight me. And he says, hey, let's go outside and fight. I would be a fool. I would be an absolute idiot to go out and fight him. The last time I got in a fight was 13, when I was 13 and I lost, okay? I'm not going to fight him one-on-one. -on -one. But what I am going to do, being out uh, uh, numbered, out supplied, I am going to uh, 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 hit him in the head with a brick, run to my car and drive away, right? That's a, that, is that cowardice or is that intelligent? Um, well, Aguinaldo and his men knew that they were outgunned, and so they took to the mountains, and they began inflicting large numbers of casualties on the American troops. It gets so bad that McKinley contemplates pulling out. At the beginning of the phase, when this first happens, McKinley says, what did I get myself into? I was the man who didn't want to go to war against the Spanish in Cuba, and now hundreds of American boys are dying in the jungles of the Philippines. It's very difficult to fight a guerrilla army. They hide among the civilian population. They know the surrounding areas. It's incredibly difficult. That being said, the Americans launch what is known as a counterinsurgency. This is when troops fight an unorthodox war against these guerrilla fighters, not the first uh, or not the last, well, not the first or the last time that American troops have fought a counterinsurgency. What the Americans do, what the Americans do is they begin to go into the civilian population and try to root out who is a rebel and who is not. In many regions, they all issue ID cards. You have to have an ID card, an American issued ID card. We need to know who you are. If you don't carry an ID card, you are subject to arrests. You can even be shot. The Americans also begin constructing, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, camps where certain populations are concentrated. What's that called? Wait, is that what the Spanish were doing? Yes, yes. Again, it's easy to be moral and preachy when you're not trying to keep an empire, when you're not trying to occupy a civilian population that perhaps doesn't want to be occupied. In this counterinsurgency, Americans burned villages. They were involved in mass killings. Uh, by the way, there are atrocities committed by both sides. There were torture techniques introduced to, to, to force civilian Filipinos or rebel Filipinos to tell the Americans what needed to be told. And we begin to inflict high, high numbers of casualties on the Filipino people. But again, you can kill many people. But if their comrades don't surrender, the war drags on. This is a, a taste of what's to come in Vietnam.
Many thousands of Filipinos are rounded up, placed in camps, questioned, tortured. It's very difficult to win the hearts and minds of a population in this sort of occupation, whether it's Iraq, Vietnam, the Philippines. These are some Americans questioning a Filipino suspected insurgent. And the caption goes, those pious Yankees can't throw stones at us anymore. You see the British, the French, the Germans are seeing the Americans doing the same sorts of things that they were so preachy about when it came to the Spanish in Cuba. It's amazing how a nation's morality and tactic, it's amazing how a nation's morality changes as its objectives change, their tactics will change. Some of the toughest fighting that took place was on Luzon Island. This was a hotbed, a hotbed of resistance. General J. Franklin Bell had to explain to the New York Times how one sixth of the population of Luzon had died in the previous two years. He's speaking to the New York Times in 1901. And he says this of the American actions on the island of Luzon. One sixth of the natives of Luzon have either been killed or have died of the dengue, dengue fever, tropical disease, in the last few years. The loss of life by killing alone has been very great, but I think not one man has been slain except where his death has served the legitimate purposes of war. It has been necessary to adopt what in other countries would probably be thought harsh measures. One sixth are dead through disease and killing because it has to be done, according to Franklin Bell. Remember, some men need to be forced to be free. William R. Shafter, the man who was carried around many times on a door in Cuba, is moved to the Philippines in command, said this. It may be necessary to kill half of the Filipinos in order that the remaining half of the population may be advanced to a higher plane of life than their present semi-barbarous state affords. Half of you might need to die for us to help you. <laughs> the island of Samar sees some very questionable actions by the United States. By modern standards, they would be called war crimes, atrocities. In September 1901, 51 American soldiers were killed in a surprise guerrilla attack. The attack provoked shock in the U.S. public. They compared it to Custer's massacre. President Roosevelt soon gave orders to pacify the island. The job was given to Jacob H. Smith. Jacob H. Smith was given orders to pacify this island. He gave the orders. He told his men, quote, I want no prisoners. I wish you to kill and burn. The more you kill and burn, the better it will please me. I want all persons killed who are capable of bearing arms in actual hostilities against the United States. He meant everyone 10 and over is to be shot. Every young man, every young, well, he says all persons, quite frankly. The result, hundreds of villages were burned and thousands were killed in Samar. Now, when the American people hear of our actions in Samar, many are shocked and disturbed. Kill and burn. Order is admitted by the Council for General Smith. He did tell Waller to make Samar a howling wilderness. Specifically said that all males over 10 were to be slaughtered. Boys of that age are as dangerous as their elders, he alleged. Kill them all. Criminals, because they were born 10 years before we took the Philippines. Many Americans were shocked and disgusted. Uh, Smith and Waller were court-martialed, although light, light, light charges were uh, 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 actually levied against them. Colonel Frederick Funston commented on this court-martial, on this outrage. He said this. He didn't understand. Why is everyone upset? Why are you putting these men on trial? How dare you? He said this, 
quote, I personally strung up 35 Filipinos without trial. So what was all the fuss over dispatching a few treacherous savages? If there had been more Smiths and Wallers, the war would have been won over long ago. Impromptu impromptu domestic hangings might also hasten the end of the war. For starters, all Americans who had recently petitioned Congress to sue for peace in the Philippines should be dragged out of their homes and lynched. This is what Funston had to say about the outcry over what happened in Samar. Nonetheless, no matter your position on American counterinsurgency tactics, it's clearly obvious that the imperial game is ensnarling us. The Philippines especially, specifically, pardon me, is ensnarling us. We see how complicated it is. We can't capture Aguanado. We can't defeat a bunch of, 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 of mountain living peasants. Are we not the greatest country that ever lived? Is manifest destiny not with us? In the end, we do in fact attain victory. By March of 1901, we have captured Aguinaldo. We force him to take a low, an oilty loath, loath, an oilty, a, an oity, a loyalty oath, pardon me. Uh, very cleverly, by the way, the Americans take a page out of the British handbook. We do not kill Aguinaldo. We do not imprison Aguinaldo. Why would you create a, 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 a martyr for rebellion? We give him a a pension, and we allow him to retire uh, from guerrilla life in a nice, paid-for home. We take care of him. You get more uh, 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 bees with honey, right, than salt or whatever, or bullets, whatever it may be. Deaths in this war. More than 4,000 American soldiers will die. 20,000 Filipino fighters will die. Estimated at around 200,000 were the numbers of Filipino civilians who die from this war, mostly from disease and hunger. The Americans have taken the Philippines. Now, the Americans proved to be much less harsh than the Germans or even the French, much more similar to the British model. What the Americans do is they put in schools, they put in hospitals, they put in rails. They also, by 1907, have turned over internal control of the island over to the Filipinos. We, of course, construct naval bases, footsteps to the east, an American presence, which we still have on American bases. And in 1946, after the Americans expel the Japanese who took over the islands during the Second World War, the Philippine Islands are granted independence, although we still have those bases. America finally got its empire scattered throughout the Pacific and the Caribbean. These are not giant territories. This is not the British Empire. This is not the French Empire. But what this is, is gas stations across the desert of the Pacific. We come to at least believe that we should rule the Pacific. And so when the Japanese emerge in the 1930s and challenge this, we see this as a tremendous threat to our sovereignty and our position in the world. The United States still has territories scattered throughout the Caribbean and the Pacific. Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, Samoa, Guam, etc. People live there, certainly, uh, but they don't have the right to vote. Today, Americans have thousands of troops, bases, ships scattered throughout the world. The American presence in the world is larger than it's ever been. Post-Soviet, we continue to uh, 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 encourage, through many means, nations to allow us to put a military and commercial presence. The two are very much connected. The Cuba question. The Cuba question. In the end, is the United States going to keep its pledge? Is Cuba going to be free and independent? Well, kind of. 
kind of. Yes, but kind of. The Platt Amendment. The Platt Amendment laid out how the United States is going to withdraw from Cuba, but also how Cuba is going to rule itself. How very nice of the Americans to tell the Cubans how they're going to rule themselves. It was introduced to Congress by Senator Orville Platt, and it lays out a few provisions. Number one, number one, the Cuban government, once it's established, could not enter any treaty that would compromise Cuban independence or allow foreign nations other than the United States to have military bases on the island. That's number one. You can't, you can't allow other countries to have bases on the island, and you cannot enter into treaties that would compromise your independence. Number two, the United States reserves the right to intervene in Cuban affairs in order to defend Cuban independence. We can invade you, if need be, to protect your independence. That's number two. Number three, Cuba must relinquish claims on the nearby island of Pines or Pines. It's an island off the coast that the Americans take. We we'll give it back later, but we take. Number four, Amer Cuba must agree to sell or lease territory for coaling and naval stations to the United States. That'll become Guantanamo Bay, which we'll look at in a minute. And number five, Cubans must incorporate the terms of the Platt Amendment into the Cuban Constitution. Then we'll pull out. You agree to the Platt Amendment, make it part of your Constitution, and we will pull out. In the end, having no choice, the Cubans accepted it and placed the Platt Amendment within their Constitution. Free, kind of. There is the island over here, right over here. We do return that. But what we really, really, really wanted was a naval base. And we get it at Guantanamo Bay in Cuba. To this day, it remains a American possession. If you go to the base, it's a little slice of the United States. It feels more like Florida than Cuba. Even when Cuba goes communist, we keep this. We keep this. We're not giving this up. What's more American than barbed wire and McDonald's? <laughs> it was at Guantanamo Bay that Camp X-Ray operated from 2001 to 2002. That name might ring a bell. Uh, following the attacks of 9-11 and the invasion of Afghanistan, we used Camp X-Ray to house suspected terrorists, oftentimes without trials. Very, very notorious grounds. When America finally shut down Camp X-Ray, we simply moved most of the troops to other military uh, prisons scattered throughout the world. Roosevelt and Latin America. In 1901, Teddy Roosevelt, who was the vice president, becomes president. We will explain how and why that occurred in a future lesson. Roosevelt was a staunch defender of U.S. imperialism and was determined that the world treat the United States as what it was, a great power. Roosevelt believed, like previous administrations, that it was up to the United States to protect Latin America from not only Europe, but from itself. And so Roosevelt is going to practice that big brother mentality that I spoke of uh, uh, earlier when it comes to Latin America. No one else can mess with you, but you better listen to me. We're going to have a couple of examples of how the United States treats Latin America. Again, we protect you, but you better listen. You had better listen. And so Roosevelt won't be the first or the last president to involve the United States in internal affairs of Latin America. Under Roosevelt, the world experienced the Venezuelan crisis. What this was, the government of Venezuela owes Great Britain and Germany a tremendous amount of money. 
It's not pain. It's not pain. And so the British and the Germans impose a naval blockade of the South American country, blocking it from trade until it pays what is owed. In the end, in the end, the United States forces the Germans, it's mostly the Germans that are involved in this blockade, to go home. Take your ships home. He threatens to move out the United States Navy. However, however, the United States then intervenes and orders Venezuela to pay back those European powers. So there you go. You can't physically involve yourself in these countries. Come to us. Come to us. We will handle it. We will have our little brother pay his debts. If you punch him, I'll punch you harder. Come to me first. We can figure it out. That's a very, very, very patronizing position to take. Now, this was all part of the Monroe Doctrine of 1823. President Monroe, back in 1823, told Europe, stay out of these newly independent Latin American countries. If you already have territory in the new world, that's fine. That's fine. But all of those South American countries that gained their independence from Spain in the early 1800s do not interfere, do not militarily come and try to take them over. But Roosevelt goes a step further. He goes a step further. He adds to the Monroe Doctrine. He says this, it, the European powers, if you have an issue with Latin America, come to us. The Roosevelt Corollary stipulates that you come to the United States, Germany, if you have an issue with Mexico. You come to the United States, France, if you have an issue with Brazil, we will be the middleman. It's very, very big brotherish. Now, we will do away with that later in the 1930s, but for a time, for a time, it's very heavy handed. And in many ways, we continue to be very heavy handed with a great many Latin American countries, that big brother mentality. Another example of the big brother, little brother was the Panama Canal. During the Spanish American War, the need to be able to move um, the American fleets around became very, very obvious. There's a problem. We have to travel thousands of miles out of our way to move our Navy from the East Coast to the West Coast. There needs to be a canal. There needs to be a canal. Now, that has been spoken about before. But under Roosevelt, it's a question of national security. It's a question of national security. And so the United States negotiates. It begins to negotiate. First, it negotiates with the French company that's already built part of this canal. It's the same company that had been involved in the Suez Canal in Egypt, but they haven't finished it for a number of reasons. The Americans tell this French company, we will give you $40 million if you hand over the canal to us and we'll complete it. The French company, who isn't doing anything with the canal anyways, because it hasn't even been completed, says, yes, we'll take it. We'll take it. Then it's time to negotiate with Colombia that owns Panama at this time. It's part of Colombia. This is an independent country. We go to the Colombians. We offer them $10 million and then $250,000 dollars a year for the next hundred years. Columbia says, no, why does the French company get 40 and we only get 10? No. Roosevelt was incensed. The Colombians are in standing in the way of progress. This is what he said. The Colombians are standing in the way of progress. Do you think we're going to let Colombia of all nations in the world stop us constructing this canal? uniting our great Atlantic and Pacific fleets. And so what do we do? Well, we begin, we begin to encourage revolt in Panama. Now for years, the Panamanians had been fighting insurgencies for independence from the Colombians. That French company, that French company that wants the $40 million begins to send cash into Panama funding 
an insurgency. When Colombia reacts against these rebels, the United States moves a battleship, a warship off the coast, telling Colombia in no uncertain words, let them win. Let them have their independence. Stop. This is happening. This is happening. In a matter of hours, the Panamanians overrun the Colombians and attain independence. The first thing that the United States does was recognize the independence of Panama. And the second thing that America does was sign with Panama a treaty that agrees to the same terms that Colombia had been offered. So Colombia, you don't like it, that's okay. You no longer own this strip of land. The Panamanians do. If Colombia doesn't want to deal with us, then we will make damn sure that Panama deals with us. Roosevelt said, if I have to go down there myself and dig the damn thing, I will. There he is, piling dirt onto the capital of Colombia. It's a question of American national security and commerce. Don't forget commerce here, guys. Construction. Construction. Until the United States constructs the atom bomb, this is our greatest feat. This is our greatest feat. Put it right up there with our 1969 landing on the moon. Because we did the impossible. We did the impossible. You see this strip of land, the French had tried. The French had tried, but this is incredibly mountainous. It's got marshes, swamps, tropical disease, killed thousands of workers when the French tried to construct this. But we, through engineering, figure out how to go over mountains literally go over mountains through a lock system. When you go through the Panama Canal, you literally get raised section by section. The French had tried to dig straight across without a lock system. That's impossible. That is impossible. That lock system is what is needed. At its peak, the Panama Canal project employed 44,000 individuals, 44,000 individuals. Many of them came from the West Indies, the Caribbean, these are the unsung heroes of the Panama Project. From 1904 to 1915, from 1904 to its completion in 1915, 5,600 lives were lost to either disease or accidents, mostly West Indians. Absolutely incredible. Cutting through mountains. We drain swamps. We realize this is where the disease is coming from, the mosquitoes. They drain entire swamps. The entire world saw this and thought, oh, my God, they are a great power. From 1915 to 1999, almost a million ships had used the canal. From 1915 to 1999, almost a million ships had traveled through this canal. In 1999, we hand over control of the Panama Canal back to Panama. The Panama Canal continues to be very, very profitable. But by the time we get to the 1990s, ships are becoming so big, both militarily and commercial, that this canal is somewhat outdated. Uh, there are plans and talks to widen the canal or build it in another location because at this point, ships are so big that, and you can look it up on YouTube, there's literally ships going through this canal with inches on each side and our big military ships and big cargo ships need to go around the Cape Horn of South America anyways. In our next lesson, we will look at Mr. Roosevelt more and a whole host of other individuals that kick off the so-called progressive movement, a time when many Americans believed it was the role of government to improve society, to improve business to improve everything, the progressive movement. Uh, did they succeed? Well, we'll have to see. Thank you so very, very, very much until we see each other again.